Chapter 15, Oscillations. Simple harmonic motion. Here are some examples. Springs, certain atomic properties, bungee jumping, playing a musical instrument, viewing the light emitted by a laser, and many more. Here's an example of simple harmonic motion. That blue object would be called a simple harmonic oscillator. You can see it's bouncing up and down, but it's bouncing up and down in a particular way. It's basically just riding that sine wave or riding that cosine wave. There are other ways this simple harmonic oscillator could bounce up and down, but that wouldn't be simple harmonic motion. This is simple harmonic motion because it's riding a sinusoidal wave. So there's some litmus test to being a simple harmonic oscillator. If you're a simple harmonic oscillator, your motion graph has to be a sine or cosine wave, as mentioned, and you have to be subjected to a restorative force. That means if you veer away from equilibrium, there's going to be a force that seeks to put you back into equilibrium. Think of a spring. If you compress a spring, the spring wants to push back to equilibrium. If you stretch a spring, if you elongate it, the spring wants to pull you back to equilibrium. We're going to hang our hats on this sinusoidal function. X equals XM times cosine of omega T plus phi. Why do we choose this function? Because again, simple harmonic motion is basically an object bouncing up and down sinusoidally. This function includes everything we need to completely describe a simple harmonic oscillator. It includes it's amplitude, angular frequency, the time variable, and a phase constant. We're going to talk about all of this stuff. Here's the detailed description for each variable in our guiding equation. When I say guiding equation, I mean our position function. If we know enough known variables, we can figure out the unknown variables for a simple harmonic oscillator's position. So let's progress just like we did in kinematics. Since I know the position function, I can take the first derivative and figure out the velocity function. Look at that velocity function. I know that at most, the value spit out by the sine function is 1. So my simple harmonic oscillator's velocity varies, but its maximum value happens when sine of omega t plus phi equals 1. This expression here, the maximum velocity equals omega times x sub m, or maximum velocity equals angular frequency times amplitude, gets used a lot. Since I know my velocity function, I take the first derivative with respect to time and I get my acceleration function. Notice acceleration is definitely not constant. It's variable. Same conversation here. Cosine of omega t plus phi can at most equal 1. So my maximum acceleration is given by omega squared times x sub m. Using the maximum acceleration value and the maximum velocity values really do come in handy. Let's visit Desmos and look at cosine of x. In Desmos, x is my independent variable. In physics, t is my independent variable. So anytime you see x in Desmos, it's the same as the variable t in physics. Here's a cosine function. Here's another cosine function, but it has an amplitude of 2. Here's another cosine function with an amplitude of 5. Amplitude of 5, amplitude of 2, amplitude of 1. Here's my cosine function again. Here's cosine of 2x. Notice cosine of 2x completes two cycles in the time it takes cosine of x to complete one cycle. cycle. Cosine of x has a period of 2 pi radians. You can see that right here. Cosine of 2x has a period of pi radians. You can see that right here. Again, cosine of x versus cosine of 2x. For cosine of x, omega equals 2 pi over t, as always, and in this instance, omega equals 1. For cosine of 2x, omega equals 2 pi over t, and in this case, omega equals 2. So for cosine of 2x, if omega equals 2 pi over t and omega equals 2, that means t equals pi. And you can see that on the graph. In a period of pi, the cosine function completes one cycle. Look at cosine of x. Omega equals 2 pi over t. Omega equals 1. So t equals 2 pi. It takes this function, 2 pi ratings, to complete one cycle. This is what cosine of x looks like. This is what cosine of x plus pi over 6 looks like. Pi over 6 represents the phase constant phi, or also referred to as the phase angle. So you can see for this function, cosine of x plus pi over 6, this function is shifted backwards by pi over 6 six radians. Think of it as a race. The green function is perfectly positioned at the starting line. The blue function is actually starting behind the green function by pi over 6 radians, which is 30 degrees. Look at this red function, cosine of x minus pi over 2 radians. 
the negative pi over 2 phase shift pushes my cosine function forward by pi over 2 radians, which is 90 degrees, and it looks just like a sine function. So a sine function is nothing more than a cosine function phase shifted forward in time by pi over 2 radians. This is called a spring mass system. A mass is attached to a spring and it's sliding back and forth on a frictionless table. It's showing how the spring force is a restorative force. It's also showing the shifting between elastic potential energy and kinetic energy, but this is our first real physical simple harmonic oscillator, a spring mass system. The restorative force is linearly related to its displacement away from equilibrium. It's bouncing back and forth in a particular way and it kind of looks like it's bouncing back and forth sinusoidally. Soidally. Here's the drawing you can put in box one. I've enlarged it so you can see it clearly. This is a spring mass system. K is the spring stiffness constant. I've grabbed the mass and I've pulled it to the right through a displacement called X. Because the spring force is a restorative force, if I pull the mass to the right, the spring force tries to pull the mass to the left. Just a reminder, if an object is subjected to a restorative force and that restorative force is linearly related to its displacement, that object will undergo simple harmonic motion. So with all of that added to box number one, boxes two through six take you through the force analysis method. Box number five, we introduce omega, and you're thinking, I already know what omega is. It's two pi over t, and omega is also known as the angular frequency or angular velocity. But it turns out we can use omega squared equals k over m as a very useful substitution. Box 5 is the outcome of our force analysis method. Box 6 is the solution to box 5. I'm basically using a guess and check approach. It's a little more complicated than that, but I'm going to guess that a cosine function might be a solution to box 5. Why guess cosine? Because cosine bounces back and forth. So if I take the second derivative of this cosine function and I add it to the product of omega squared times this cosine function, it equals 0. So I've basically guessed correctly. This function is a solution to my second order ordinary differential equation. And you're thinking, I've seen this before. This is where we kind of started the conversation right here. So all we're saying in box six is that the solution to a spring mass system is the same as a simple harmonic oscillator function, which makes sense because a spring mass system moves according to simple harmonic motion. We started with the position function for simple harmonic motion. We then came up with velocity and acceleration functions. So that's kinematics. Then we progress to force and now we're progressing to energy analysis. Put this visual in your box number one. It's a spring mass system that is located to the right of its equilibrium position so it's elongated. Its displacement is x away from its equilibrium position. At this particular moment the box is moving to the right. It's displaced to the right of its equilibrium position so the spring force being restorative is pointing to the left. Boxes two through through seven go into the energy analysis of this situation. In box number two, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, just like always. But now I have a fancy expression for my velocity of a simple harmonic oscillator. Its velocity equals omega times x sub m times sine of omega t plus phi, and I'm squaring that here. Box number two is showing me the kinetic energy at this instant. Box number three is showing me the elastic potential energy at this instant. Box number four is saying the total energy in this case, the term mechanical energy is being used because there is no non-conservative work. So the total energy at this location is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. Let's go from box 4 to box 5 using that omega squared equals k over m substitution, again, which is unique for a spring mass system. Box 6, do you recognize the trig identity anywhere in box 5? Yes, I do. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So I'm going to pull out common factors and go from box 5 to box 7. So boxes 1 through 7 address energy analysis of a simple harmonic oscillator, specifically pertaining in this case to a spring mass system. Here's our next simple harmonic oscillator, a pendulum. Boxes 1 through 9 use the force analysis method, specifically with torques, to give us an expression for the period of a simple pendulum, which you see here in box 9. Some noteworthy mentions, box number 3 uses the small angle approximation. Sine theta is approximately equal to theta, assuming we're using radians. Go ahead and put your calculator into radian mode and figure out what the sine of 
0.1 radians is. It's about 0 0.0998 or again sine of theta equals theta as long as we're using radians and as long as we're talking about relatively small angles. You can see that here in this graph. Look at the green line. The green line represents the sine of the angle and look where my cursor is. This is again saying that the sine of x is pretty much equal to x for angles of about 0.2 radians. Very close agreement between sine x and x for small angles. In this case, the small angle is around uh, 0.2 radians. We're going to sidestep physical pendulums for now. This next section is called damped simple harmonic motion. So we're not going to ignore losses. Losses could come from friction or air resistance or drag. Whatever the reason for the losses, we're going to refer to all of them collectively as a damping force. That's an umbrella term. We're going to use this expression for damping force. It's linearly related to velocity, so it's always trying to fight velocity. That's what that negative sign means. The greater the velocity, the greater the damping force. You saw this animation before. Here it is again, except we're not ignoring damping. You can see the friction force is stealing energy and if we wait long enough, this sinusoidal graph is going to start to decay it's going to start to damp out. Look at how my elastic potential energy and kinetic energies are depleting because I'm losing energy to friction. Look how the amplitude of my simple harmonic motion is getting smaller and smaller and pretty soon it flatlines. Let's look at box three. I've added a drag force vector, which again is the umbrella term for all of the loss mechanisms, friction, air resistance, etc. This drag force vector is reflected in this term, negative b times dx dt. dx dt is the velocity. That term b is my damping coefficient. A small damping coefficient means not a whole lot of loss. A large damping coefficient means great loss. There's my restorative spring force, F subscript s it's also pointing in the negative x direction so that's why that has a negative sign along with a negative sign for negative b dx dt and it equals mass times acceleration acceleration expressed as d squared x dt squared so if we process our force analysis statement box number four shows an updated version of our position function for in this case a damped simple harmonic oscillator this term natural log base e raised to a power of negative bt over 2m is the amplitude modifier. This is my sinusoidal term. This is the term that describes how this system is bouncing back and forth. So everything is unchanged again except for this amplitude modifier which does account for the damping effect. Box number five is a new expression for omega, angular frequency or angular velocity. Angular frequency omega equals 2 pi over m. Generically, in the case of a spring mass oscillator, omega equals the square root of k over m, but that gets modified a bit here in box five to reflect damping. So damped simple harmonic motion has a modified amplitude term and a modified omega term. Look at this function, cosine of 5x minus pi over 3. Now look at this function, e to the negative 0.2x. Look at the two functions together. Look at what happens when I multiply the two functions together. I get damped simple harmonic motion. Notice how the amplitude is dissipating as time goes on. There's my exponential envelope showing again how the amplitude is decaying. This red function again is what undamped simple harmonic motion looks like. Here's a really good demonstration of driven harmonic motion. It's not showing damping, but it is showing a driving force. I have a one kilogram mass sitting on a spring with a spring constant of 157.9 newtons per meter. I'm driving this spring mass system sinusoidally with a frequency of one hertz. You can see I'm not getting a real strong response. Let's try going from one hertz to 1.5 hertz. And I thought for a minute things we're looking a little bit more lively but still not much of a response. Let's go to 2 hertz and now you can see a strong response. This is because the driving force is a sinusoidally driving force that's matched with the natural frequency of the spring mass system. In other words, the driving frequency matches the natural frequency. When that happens, you get a situation called resonance. So
So if two hertz is good, three hertz has got to be better. What happens if I change my driving frequency from two hertz to three hertz? And you can see I don't have resonance. I'm not matching the natural frequency of the spring mass system with my driving frequency. And now I'm out of resonance. This is not a strong response. My natural frequency is not matched by the driving frequency. So this is it. Box two is my X-Force inventory. Look at my free body diagram. There is my sinusoidal driving force F naught times sine omega D times T. Omega D is the driving frequency. At this instant, it's pointing to the right. There's my damping force, negative BX, negative because it's opposing the velocity, and at this moment, the velocity is going to the right, so the drag force is pointing to the left, and DX DT is velocity. There's my restorative spring force, and there is mass times acceleration, which is D squared X DT squared. Box number three, I'm going to guess that that is a solution to box number two. It turns out it is. We have to rely a little bit on differential calculus. It's really not that much of a stretch, but that is a solution. Box three is a solution. This A term, A times cosine omega dt plus phi, that A is given in box four. So things are pretty complicated here, but there's a few key takeaways. Resonance happens when the driving frequency matches the natural frequency. Omega n in box five is the natural frequency. We recognize that. Omega equals k over m. And this graph shows what happens to my amplitude at resonance. Notice that I have that large spike when the driving force is matching the natural frequency.